So good afternoon and welcome to the Australian Stockholm Junior Water Prize finalist presentations. I'm Katie Trevor and I look after the National Awards program here at the Australian Water Association. I'd like to start today's webinar by acknowledging the traditional inhabitants of the land from where I am presenting today. The Aboriginal people, their spirits and ancestors and acknowledge the vital contribution that Indigenous people and cultures make to this nation that we share. The Australian Stockholm Junior Water Prize is the biggest water science competition for high school students and is proudly supported by Xylem. The prize aims to challenge young people to think big and take a fresh look at local and global water problems. The winner announced today will go on to represent Australia on the international stage, competing with over 35 countries later this year. We are very proud that Australia currently holds the title for the International Stockholm Junior Water Prize, with McKinley Butson taking home the win for us last year in August. For those of you familiar with our Australian Water Awards program, today's announcement looks a little bit different to our traditional national awards presentation at the Oswater Gala dinner, which was actually set to be held tonight in Adelaide. I do like to see today's webinar as one of the positives that has come out of being forced to do things a little bit differently. And that is this opportunity for our finalists to share with you, the industry, the projects that they've been working on for the past 12 months. Today, you will hear from four innovative young water scientists, Olivia Arvanitis, George Tian, Emma Ceresia and Phoebe Payne. The judging has all been completed prior to today, so this webinar is really about showcasing these incredible young minds. Before I introduce our first finalists, I'd just like to give you a quick overview of the proceedings. So we've given each finalist eight minutes to present their project, which will be directly followed by four minutes of question time. This question time is for you, our audience. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat box at any time during the finalist presentation. Following the presentations, we will have a few words from our award sponsor, Xylem's Managing Director, Oceana, Jim Athanas, and then I'll hand over to the association's Chief Executive, Jonathan McEwen, to announce this year's winner. I would finally like to advise that this session is being recorded and will be shared publicly with those who are unable to join us today. Time now for our first finalist presentation. I'd like to welcome Olivia Arvanitis from Meriden School in New South Wales. Hi. Um, Hi, Olivia. We can see you. So if you can start sharing your slides. Yeah. Um, Great. Okay. When you're ready. Okay. Uh, so my project was the Autonomous Water Monitoring System. Um, and so in our rapidly industrializing world, uh, we have a lot more um, greater use of resources in industries such as the agricultural industry, um, the clothing industry. A lot of this production, um, the use of these resources leads to a large amount of waste. Um, and often this isn't monitored um, in terms of how it affects the environment. Um, and often it can mean that it runs off into natural waterways and impacts the ecosystems around us. Um, so what you can see on the left hand side is a waterway in New Zealand, which was a few years ago um, polluted um, quite heavily by um, runoff from the agriculture industry from uh, sheep farming and cattle farming. Um, and that meant that a lot of the waterways were damaged. And also on the right, um, an increase in nitrogen and phosphates in the water, which is presumably from, uh, for example, the runoff of fertilizers, uh, that really increased uh, the growth of crown of thorn starfish, which feed on the coral. Um, that meant that the ecosystem uh, became damaged because of that. Um, so I think that um, a monitoring system and a, a procedure where monitoring is really incorporated into um, like uh, commercial industries is really important. So that increases environmental awareness and an understanding of how these different processes really impact the environment so that a solution can be made um, so that there's less of an impact. 
Um, so my prototype and solution to this was to create an autonomous water monitoring system. Um, and this is based on color changing reagents. So how it works is a water sample is taken and this is mixed with a reagent. Um, and then when this is mixed together, the water sample changes a particular color based on the concentration of a chemical. So if you're looking at the concentration of nitrates, for example, it will change color based on the concentration of nitrates. Um, and then an RGB sensor will measure this color change uh, and will convert this qualitative data of color into quantitative data and send that off to a Bluetooth device uh, where it can be logged and later used for things such as graphing. Um, yeah. And so current solutions in this area include uh, really accurate probes. Um, now these do accurately measure concentrations of different chemicals. However, uh, most of them measure only one type um, and they can be quite expensive. So some sets uh, that measure quite a large amount of different types of chemicals um, and can send data off via Wi-Fi, um, they can cost up to $7,000, uh, which makes it not as feasible um, if it was, for example, used by a farmer who just wants to see uh, some of the impact of their new processes. Um, and something on the right, um, you can see uh, it's, a much, it's a cheaper solution, around $400 to $900, um, which is used in like household aquariums, but they do um, have a much uh, lower capacity to uh, measure more chemicals. So they measure things such as calcium and the pH, uh, but you can't really mix and match uh, what you want to test for. Um, so I think the benefits of my um, prototype is that it is quite versatile. Uh, because it does use color changing reagents, this means that you can easily pick and choose uh, what you want to test for. So if you were testing for nitrates originally, and then you wanted to test for something like chlorine, you could just swap out that reagent and you could test for a different chemical. Um, and I think that makes it really effective in, um, for different environments. So if you wanted to use it on the riverside to see um, how much runoff was going into the water and what that meant for the environment, or if you wanted to test pool water at home, um, and that can really help as well. Uh, and I think it's also uh, very cost effective um, because it does use these reagents. It means that you don't have to keep purchasing uh, really expensive probes just to uh, test for a different chemical. Uh, so that does make it more um, cost effective. Um, and I think uh, if the current prototype was to be commercialized at this stage, um, then to test one chemical at a time would have cost uh, approximately $25. But if you were to test four chemicals at a time, it'd be around $70. Um, and I think the prototype is also very portable uh, because it is able to uh, log data via Bluetooth. Um, it can be used even in remote areas as long as there is a connection to the Bluetooth device. Um, and because the power source can be either from battery or solar power, uh, it does make it more portable um, and versatile also in the locations that you can use it for. Uh, but there are some improvements I would like to make before I think it's ready for commercialization. Um, and some of them are to make it more user friendly. Uh, so producing an LED screen or an interactive display would allow users to interact with it more. Say if the reagent they used required a different amount, say three drops instead of five drops um, compared to another reagent, they could easily set that. Um, and also something like an alert system, whether it just be a sound or a light, um, it can really help identify uh, problems and notify users of what's going on. Say if there's too high of a concentration of a chemical in water, they could set it to have an alarm. Um, and I'd also like to improve the effectiveness by using something like an ArduCam or another camera because um, that really improves the measuring of the color change as compared to the current RGB sensor. And since right now it works on the color values that I personally import into the code, um, so that means it's only based on the brand of reagent that I use. Um, but having an Ardu cam means that users can use any reagent they want and just have it take a photo of the color chart that comes with it um, and have those color values pulled out so that it can easily compare it to any brand or different type of reagent. I mean, one last improvement I'd like to make at this stage is the efficiency through using a GPS system. And this can make it a lot more um, efficient in terms of, say, if the government wanted to monitor a particular section of the environment, say, like a national park, they could easily get that data remotely um, and also allows them to see uh, where the problem areas are really at. So it allows for targeting solutions. 
Um, so I think whether it were to be commercialized or if it was made as an open source product, I think both would be good um, in allowing the environmental awareness to be increased. So um, it would really help to incorporate it into people's practices because it is so cheap and versatile. And it does mean that it can really help spread awareness as to um, what processes are causing what issues and how a solution can be made. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Now we've just got some questions coming in. So we'll just take a look at a few of those. Um, I have a quick question for you. And that is just, um, where did you get your inspiration from to come up with this autonomous monitoring system? It's just incredible. Um, yeah, so um, it started when I was noticing um, these issues because while we were in school, we were learning about things like eutrophication. Um, and I thought that was quite a big issue. And then I began to see it in um, some of the parks around where I live. And I thought, oh, this could really be um, an impact in a lot of areas around the world. Um, so after doing some research into it, I began by making a first prototype, uh, which was only for testing for ammonia and for the pH. Um, and then slowly I began to change it so that it could be more versatile and used for a lot of different, um, a lot of different uh, types of chemicals and reagents. So it can be used in a lot of different situations. Um, sorry, I can't really hear. Um. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can hear now. Yeah. Thanks. You can hear me now. Sorry. I was just trying to read the screen at the same time. So our first question here is from James Cleaver. He says, Olivia, I love this invention. How much data can you store before needing to upload? How long can it be in a remote area before uploading? Um, I can't quite remember the exact storage, but I think it was quite a lot. I think it was at least like 100 data points but I'm not too sure I would have to double check that because it is based on a um, Bluetooth module that I purchased. So it's based on the capability of that. Um, and in terms of using it remotely, I think as long, I think it was within um, like a kilometer or a bit more, I think it could connect easily as well. Okay, great. So our next question here is from Hui. So Hui says, I have a question regarding the accuracy of this device. How accurate is it? Um, so the accuracy of measuring the uh, concentrations of different chemicals at the moment, it's largely based on the reagents that you use. Um, so the more accurate the reagent you use, obviously, the more um, accurate it's going to be able to measure the water. Um, at the moment, using an RGB sensor is quite um, accurate in measuring the colour changes. However, say if the colours were um, closer together for different values, then I think um, an RUCAM would definitely increase the accuracy. But as long as that was able to correctly um, and accurately measure the color change, uh, the accuracy of the total device um, depends on the reagent that you use. Great, thank you. So we've got time for one last question. Um, so this last question is from Jörg Keller. And Jörg asks, have you compared the results of your sensor with independent laboratory analysis? How well do they compare? Um, I haven't compared it to um, much secondary data in terms of being done by someone else, but to test my device, I did um, test the individual components of the prototype and then the final data um, that it got of the concentration um, of a chemical in the water. I compared that to a sample that I manually did using the same reagent, but it wasn't done um, using data uh, made by like a government or anything yet. Great, thank you. We'll have to stop there. Thank you again, Olivia. We really hope to see your prototype being manufactured commercially in the future. Thank you. So our next finalist, George Tian, is from Queensland Academies for Health Sciences. Welcome, George. Great, so we can see your PowerPoint, George, and we just um, get your image up as well so that we can see your video. Great, we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. In Australia, the Great Barrier Reef is a vital economic and ecological asset. However, coral bleaching is threatening the survival of such important ecosystems in Australia and worldwide. Certain chemicals can induce coral bleaching, 
and the chemical that was researched in this study is 2-ethylhexyl 3,4-methoxyphenyl proteinoate, or EHMT for short. It is a UVB filter used in over 10,000 products, including sunscreens and cosmetics. It can enter the ocean from washing off the skin of beachgoers who have applied products containing EHMC. But the largest source, largest source of contamination is from wastewater treatment plant effluent, as the processes within the plant cannot completely remove aqueous EHMC. It had been detected in concentrations up to four micrograms per liter in surface water samples, with a potential to biomagnify it has endocrine disrupting effects in humans and aquatic organisms, including being able to induce coral bleaching. This has caused regions such as Hawaii and Florida to ban products containing EHMC. Currently, a cheap yet effective method of removing aqueous EHMC is lacking. UV disinfection and chlorination, whilst cheap, showed removal efficiencies of 60% and 31% respectively, and may produce toxic byproducts. Whilst reverse osmosis showed 99% efficiency, setting up and maintaining a treatment plant will be costly. A potential solution that was explored in the study is the process of adsorption. Adsorption is the concentration of a chemical species from a solution onto the surface of a solid, and the process is already being used in industries and in households. For example, Activated carbon is being used in water filters and gas masks. The adsorbent of focus in the study was organic clay, which is produced by exchanging the sodium cations in bentonite with quaternary ammonium cations attached to 12 to 18 atom long carbon chains. This allows organic clay to be both hydrophobic and organophilic. In preliminary trials, four adsorbents were tested for their effectiveness at removing EHMC. Activated carbon, purified sand, C18, and organic clay. Two, four, and six cubic centimeters of each adsorbent were placed in the adsorption columns, with the exception of C18, which came in pre-made columns. Then 10 milliliters of EHMC solution was diluted through the column under gravity, and the amount of EHMC that remained in solution was measured using UV visible spectroscopy. When using activated carbon, carbon particles passed into the alloate, hindering measurement. Although C18 showed high adsorption efficiency, pressure had to be applied to the column, otherwise the flow rate was too slow. Hence, these two adsorbents were eliminated. Out of the remaining options, organic clay exhibited more than 10% higher adsorption efficiency than sand across all three amounts of adsorbent tested. Therefore, organic clay was further tested in the re-elution trials. Re-elution is the process of passing the alloate back through the original adsorption column, which mimics possible processes in a wastewater treatment plant. The EHMC solutions were eluted through the same columns four times, and a sample was collected after each elution. A new analytical method for measuring the EHMC concentration was introduced, the BLT screen, a bioassay utilizing luminescent bacteria. When exposed to EHMC, some bacteria die, decreasing their luminescence, and by measuring this decrease in luminescence, the toxicity of EHMC can be quantified. Along with UV visible spectroscopy, the two techniques allow for adsorption efficiency of organic clay to be contextualized chemically and biologically. The BLT screen was also used to find the minimal inhibitory concentration, the MIC, below which EHMC concentration must be reduced for organic clay adsorption and relution to be deemed effective. UV visible spectroscopy showed that one elution was sufficient in lowering EHMC concentration to below the MIC. Three elutions removed 97.6%, whereas further elutions slightly increased EHMC concentration. This may be caused by further elutions washing the EHMC off the already saturated organic clay. Meanwhile, the BLT screen showed two elutions were needed to lower EHMC concentrations to below the MIC. The discrepancy between the number of elutions required was attributed to differences in bacterial responses between the two BLT screen trials performed. This limitation could have been overcome by using the same batch of bacteria for both trials. Nevertheless, both methods showed organic clay adsorption and re-elution 
was able to lower EHMC concentrations to below the MIC using a reasonable number of volutions. Hence, this technique is deemed effective. However, a few limitations were present in the study. The MIC, as determined by the BLT screen, may not be low enough to guarantee that the EHMC will not, be, will not have toxic effects on aquatic organisms, as the study did not consider the potential for EHMC to biomagnify. Therefore, the real MIC of EHMC is likely to be lower than what was found in the study. Hence, the number of volutions required may be higher. Therefore, further research that quantifies the biomagnification of EHMC will help in finding the real MIC. It was, it, was, it was also difficult to obtain a linear set of EHMC standards, as EHMC has very low solubility in water. Solvents such as acetonitrile or methanol could have been used to obtain more accurate UV visible spectrometer readings. With further research, devices utilizing organic clay adsorption could be attached to swimming pool outlets, bathroom sinks, or wastewater treatment plants to prevent EHMC from entering the ocean. As decontamination from swimmers, as, sorry, as contamination from swimmers and surfers are likely concentrated at beaches, decontamination devices could be installed at such locations. By investing into such solutions, we can strive for a cleaner, healthier Australia. Thank you. Sorry, Katie, I still can't hear you. Sorry. Um, so thank you very much, George. We've got a few questions coming through. So I'll start with um, one from James Cleaver. George, is it possible to reuse the organ organoclay or to revitalize it? Um, in my study, I didn't consider the potential for organoclay to be reused. Um, there certainly, certainly is potential for organoclay uh, for the EHMC to be removed from the organoclay because it is a, it's only a very weak intermolecular force holding it on. But uh, in the study, I didn't uh, consider how much can be taken off. Okay, something that you could look further into then. So the next question is from Johan. So were you able to calculate exactly, exactly how much organoclay would be needed to remove EHMC from a typical shower effluent? Um, I didn't research shower effluents in the study. Um, I used a 40 ppm uh, EHMC solution. And um, it was 10 mils of that solution to four cubic centimeters of organic clay. Uh, however, that is very much above what um, at the amount of organic clay needed. So I didn't uh, see how little organic clay was needed to obtain the same uh, results. Great, thank you. Do we have it? Uh, we have probably got time for one more question if there's one to come through. Have a look at that chat box. Someone's come through um, our Q&A. So this one's from David. George, great project and presentation. Did you test whether the efficiency of removal reduced with the presence of other chemicals? Um, no, I didn't. And that is another limitation of the study is that uh, organic clay is non-selective. So it may um, attract other chemicals. Uh, which may also uh, reduce its efficiency at removing organic clay. So that is something else that uh, I must consider if I was to uh, implement this in, say, a wastewater treatment plant. Great, great answer. Thank you very much, George. And um, your project really tackles a huge problem that's affecting our oceans and reef. I'd also like to thank the Queensland Academies for Health Sciences for always continuing to sponsor this competition. We really appreciate your entries each year. Thank you, George. Thanks, Katie. So I'd next like to invite our next finalist, um, Emma Ceresier from Bishop Druitt College in New South Wales. Welcome, Emma. Hi, everyone. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear um, you, Emma. <laughs> good. Um, so I'm at home at the moment and my internet's a bit sketchy, so I pre-recorded the video um, so it doesn't drop out. Um, but I'll be here at the end to answer any questions. So I hope you enjoy it. This egg is a miracle of nature. 
It can grow a new life, but is also a valuable food source. What is left at the end, the shell, is normally considered a waste product that ends up as landfill. I want to share with you my research that indicates that this waste shell is also one of nature's miracles with incredible qualities that can assist with keeping our water sources pristine. Growing up on a remote rural property led to my fascination with eggs. I also feel personally responsible for our environment and future food sustainability. I know there must be an achievable balance between how and where we live, what we eat and drink, and a healthy, thriving planet. On my farm, I have observed phosphate runoff from fertilizers and animal manures into the natural waterways, causing them to become eutrophic. Agricultural operations, such as mine, are large consumers of non-renewable fertilizers and large producers of bio-waste materials. These issues come at great economic and environmental cost. With environmental conditions changing, it is predicted that a warmer climate will result in increased heavy rainfall in fewer, more intense flood events, with longer dry spells in between. This means that it is even more critical for these issues to be addressed. This was apparent with the recent catastrophes of the prolonged drought, bushfires, heat waves, thunderstorms and floods. I observed firsthand the layers of manure piling up in my paddocks for months, then masses of rain falling down and draining brown polluted runoff into the natural water systems. The aim of my research was to attempt to offset these issues by identifying potential biowaste adsorbents and examining their effectiveness in decreasing the orthophosphate concentration in aqueous solutions. I then applied them directly to runoff areas to determine their ability as adsorbents and soil conditioners. I selected the following bio-waste materials, eggshell, citrus peel, ceteria grass, wool, cardboard, sawdust, banana and potato on the basis of their abundance, availability, cost, renewability and biodegradable properties. I tested these in an amount of rainwater with a known phosphate concentration for 24 hours to find that cardboard decreased it by 42% and eggshell by 62%. I decided to continue further testing with the eggshell as I felt it had a real application particularly in developing countries. I wanted to extend the testing application to real time on one of my farm paddocks, such as where my sheep are concentrated at night. This was undertaken with further testing on the eggshell waste in manure and rainwater runoff simulation for 24 hours, resulting in orthophosphate reductions of around 59%, indicating effective adsorption. So this is the link that brings together the miracle of nature future food production and clean water. I analysed the costs and benefits of this eggshell application to show what impact this household waste could have on farmers, both environmentally and economically. I coded this data into a website, which I am still working on, but it shows the cost savings and application rates of eggshell. The purpose of this is to be an easily accessible tool for farmers to calculate themselves how much eggshell they would need to apply based on their paddock size, average rainfall, number of he head of particular animals, ground cover and the reduction in artificial superphosphate as a consequence of keeping the phosphate in the soil rather than it running off. The UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development provides a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet, now and into the future, and makes an urgent call for action from all countries. Of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals listed, my research into the application of eggshell waste to the soil as an adsorbent of orthophosphates relates to 11 of these. This may appear to be an exaggerated claim, however history has shown that we can address global problems on local scales. My research and its application into a website are my contribution to combating some of the issues we face in the agricultural community 
that ultimately have an impact on every single one of us. For some questions there, so we'll just wait for some um, questions to come in there. But um, we loved your we loved your presentation and um, the UN development um, sustainable development goals at the end there. That's something that um, the water industry um, really talk about a lot, and something that was going to be a big topic for us um, at our Oswater conference, which was um, set to be held in Adelaide now, but is now um, going to be made digital and. Um, Everyone will hear an announcement about that tomorrow. So yeah, really great that you could tie that into the sustainable development goals. Thank you. So we've got a question here um, from Jörg again. So great project and presentation, well done. What would be the typical amount of eggshells needed um, for your own farm? Um, so ultimately this is quite variable. Um, my website takes into account a lot of different factors so the land cover and um what type of animals are on it and also other artificial applications and rainfall but um to be honest i don't know the exact figures i do realize that um it may be a lot of eggshell required for areas but there is a lot of eggshell waste each year um and it is just going to landfill. So I think the redirection is um, certainly better than just it going to landfill. Um, and how often my calculator also, um, I'm working on it accurately predicting this, um, but I created an equation that shows an amount per week. So um, after seven days, the equation approaches zero concentration. So um, yeah, my web website, hopefully we'll calculate that on a weekly basis. Great, so you've answered um, Johan's question then too. Oh, <laughs> That's okay. And so we've got another question here from Joshua. So how would you see farmers applying the eggshell to their paddocks? Would it only be needed to be applied on downstream perimeters, for example? Um, this is sort of not something that I particularly looked into, but I do know that eggshell has other beneficial um, other benefits of poor soil. So some farmers actually apply uh, calcium carbonate, which is what eggshell is made of, to the soil directly. So I think that if possible, application evenly throughout the um, whole paddock would, um, yeah, be beneficial for it. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, well, I'll just... Um Wait, one more question before I wrap that up, sorry. Um, this one's from Michael. So Emma, really interesting application. Given the quantity required, is it possible to create a compound like eggshell to do the same job? That's from Michael from SEQ Water up in Queensland. Um, yeah, there is a lot of study into artificial um, bioadsorbents already. However, I wanted to choose something that's um, that was a natural waste product and already a wasteful resource. So to me, it was important to redirect something that is a waste product to have another purpose. So I'm sure there would be, I know there are other products that are probably more efficient. However, um, this is just a free accessible, um, yeah, waste item that has shown benefits. Great, thank you so much, Emma. Um, your project really provides such a practical tool that farmers can use to help counteract their environmental footprint. So thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, and last but certainly not least, I'd like to invite Phoebe Pang from Menai High School in New South Wales to present her project. So we can see you now, Phoebe. Hello. All right. Hello. Good afternoon. Glad you guys saved the best for last. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> and thank we've you got to... your PowerPoint too, so you can um, begin. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you to everyone who went before me and um, I pay my respects as well. So what I was looking at is microplastics and how they affect the ability of an oyster to filter the water. So a bit about um, my project first is Let's talk about microplastics and what my problem that I'm tackling is. So a bit about microplastics is that microplastics are simply plastics that break down over time in the ocean. 
And since Earth is about 71% water and oceans comprise 96.5% of the Earth's surface, um, the amount of plastics that have accumulated in the water and eventually broken down into microplastics uh, drastically increases per year. As you can see, um, plastic production is in the millions of tons per year. And since all of that eventually leads into the oceans and then break down there, um, microplastics is a problem that is very quickly becoming something that can't just be left behind as a future thought. So microplastics, are they a future thought or a present problem? To answer that question, we have to quickly tackle the mentality that is, why should we care about them? So a lot of people currently in the world think, why should we care about microplastics if it's not impacting me? That I think is one of the biggest problems in society, the belief that we can leave things until later. So my experiment pla plans to expose this fundamental flaw in thinking and show that we can't actually wait any longer. So here's another question. How do they impact our waters and why is this a Looks like um, Phoebe's just frozen there. So we might just grab, um, get her to get on the phone line so she can continue her presentation. So just bear with me a few seconds while I just um, organize that. Hello. Hello. Hi, Phoebe, we've got you back there. So um, if you want to continue, um, you were where you were from, um, pick up where you left off. Yeah, okay. I'm very sorry for that. Um, I don't, how far was I disconnected? Was there an, was there an indication? Yeah, on that slide there. Uh, go oh, on forward this one. Slide. No, forward one. Forward one. This one? Yep, that slide. Yep. Okay, I'm very sorry. I don't actually know why my connection's I bad. I think you just Shouldn't finished be. that slide, actually. So you probably could start on the next just one. Just finished? Yep. All right. Okay, very sorry about that. So allow me to introduce to you guys the oyster. It's a mollusk. You've probably eaten it in your lifetime or seen it on the market. And what they do is filter feeders. So they naturally clean water while they eat what's in the water. In this case, it's phytoplanktons. And what they can do for us is they basically allow the water to be clean so turtles and fish and any aquatic environment can actually live. Um, not only does that it have an Phoebe, it's just started um, buffering again. So we're just going to turn off your video. So, it having might and just... have like so experiment was looking at. Sorry, Phoebe, we've, um, we have lost you from the screen. Maybe if we, um... are you there, Phoebe? Hello? Yep. Yeah, okay. We've got you can back. You hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so can you see my audio on my screen? Is it just me? Yeah, we can, hear your vi we can hear you and we can see your presentation. So I think we'll just leave it, at, we'll leave it um, just without your video showing because I think it might um, work a little bit better. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, you guys can't see my amazing face anymore. I'm very sorry, loss. No, I'm joking. Um, okay, so I've bridged the connection. So would more microplastics mean that the oysters are unable to perform their jobs as, as filter feeders? That's what my experiment looked at. And my main concern was looking at its immediate effects to combat the thought that we can leave it for later. So this formed the basis for my experiment. Would the water clarity be impacted by the increasing amount of microplastics? And that in turn means if it's impacted immediately, then we simply can't let this problem fester. So what's my experiment? That's my experiment. And this is what I did for it. So every, um, I began with 30 beakers, all filled with 200 milliliters of water and eight milliliters of phytoplankton. 
I also injected um, incrementing amounts of microplastics and then added an oyster. Every 30 minutes, I would take a cuvette uh, just with a pipette and basically I would filter it every, uh, I'll filter every sample I collected and then place the cuvette in a dark room and shine light through it with a light probe at the back. Basically what I was simulating was whether or not the amount of light would change, uh, the amount of light passing through would change. The more amount of light there was meant the more clear the water was and the less amount of light meant that the oysters were unable to filter as fast. So here's um, how did I reduce the errors? Well, I filtered it, so that would remove any pseudofeces from the oysters, but also remove any um, basically excrement that was left behind. I also used a dark room to make sure that the light was as concentrated as possible and not from any outside sources. Um, some limitations was, of course, I was using school equipment, so the dark room was not a real dark room. It was artificially constructed, and as such, I had to basically counteract this by having a blank reading and then subtracting it to make sure that the changes in the day weren't actually affecting my data. So what school equipment was used? I used standard things like beakers, uh, a light probe, um, filter funnels, filter papers, things like that. And I would basically repeat this every 30 minutes for every single one of my oysters. Here's a, a little image of what my setup looked like. Um, first image on the left, excluding the phytoplankton that I used was the burette, which I used to accurately add the phytoplankton. And then there was also my setup with all the air stones to make sure that the oysters weren't dying for other reasons. My filter funnel setup. And then finally at the bottom is just the darkroom setup that I used. Great, so what did I find out? What's important about this? Um, and what trends were created? This is the graph that was created. It might look a bit confusing, but I'll walk you through it. So as you can see at the top, it has the microliters that, of microplastics that I used. The darkest line is the darkest, um, uh, the highest amount of microplastics used. Now, as you can see from this graph, that all the lighter, less microplastic concentrated actually peak in about the first hour or so, whereas those with microplastics have a resting period. Now, this is actually very important because it means that immediately the oysters with less microplastics were filtering faster, uh, were filtering immediately, whereas those with microplastics don't actually filter or hit their peak until one hour in. And basically that what, what that concludes is that it actually blocks the oysters or the oysters aren't actually filtering for the first hour when more microplastics were added in. So what does that, um, what does the actual, um, what were the actual results that I received at the end? Well, the more microplastics you put in, surprisingly, the clearer the water was. And it is a, was a very consistent result that occurred. Every single um, oyster that had more microplastics would filter more. That's undeniable. So does that mean that it's advantageous to have microplastics? Unfortunately not in the long term. Now in the short term, you can argue that, oh, the water's clearer immediately. But the issue with that is, is that the microplastics actually immediately impact the oysters, causing them not to filter. So the long-term answer is no, it's not a sustainable practice to have more microplastics. Um, I found some research by another, uh, another group of researchers who did their experiment over two months. The waters will be cleaner immediately, but in the long term, they actually compromise their reproductive functioning. So that also means in the longer term, the waters will have less oysters and therefore be less clear since the oysters are giving up their reproductive ability to filter faster. This means algal blooms can occur more frequently and as the algae will know, um, the phytoplankton and algae would, won't have any more predators, the marine species dependent on cleaner waters will basically be impacted as a whole. And here are the microplastics that I used under an electron microscope. So as you can see, it's what microplastics alone is what looks like on the left, whereas in the oyster tissue, it is compressed after the oyster tries to push it through pretty much. So how does this experiment tackle the main problem, which is we, we can just worry about it in the future? The first thing is this was done in as little as 30 minutes, there was a result. So the fact that the waters will be impacted by microplastics in something as little as 30 minutes makes this issue something that needs to be addressed immediately by, the, by everyone. 
So allowing for an understanding of short-term effects, we can also understand that um, the long-term impacts will be much more drastic than simply having a little bit of colored water. What better way to make people acknowledge the threat to our oceans than to show short-term impacts of microplastics? What this also does is we can appreciate our marine ecosystem. We love our clear waters and the oysters that make it clear is no different. And finally, by making sure people are aware of this problem, there can be greater acknowledgement to the issue of microplastics and funding towards tidier waterways and cleaner seas can occur and people may find themselves volunteering to clean the nearby streams. So what are some things to go from from here? So firstly, it addresses the issue of how crucial it is for the public to know about this danger. Secondly, this was a short term, um, short term experiment. So of course, long term studies can come from here. Um, there are criticisms that this is undue speculation and all this microplastics danger is exaggerated. But the trend that the plastic production is increasing and then breaking down is one that can't be denied. And I also think preparing for the worst is much better than letting the problem basically escalate from not doing anything. As such, uh, increasing the microplastic count beyond 100 microliters and then decreasing the size to simulate the breaking down of microplastics and having it run for longer than two hours and 30 minutes can also show just what will happen to our waters in the future if we don't do anything. And then further beyond this, combining this experiment of a short term with something that will be a long term experiment will become irrefutable evidence that we can't wait any longer for an issue as severe as this. So are microplastics a future thought or present problem? The answer is both and we have to act now. So whole world's your oyster, it's question time. I'll do my best to answer any of your questions. So feel free to ask me. I can't hear you, sorry. Thank you, Phoebe, for such a great presentation. Um, some really interesting findings you, um, you had there with your, um, with your research. So we're just getting some questions in now. Um, I'll just get the chat box up so I can uh, see some questions. So um, we have a um, question here from um, Jorg. Um, oyster filter water, oysters filter water to gain food. So do your results not just mean that when you add microplastics the, that do not like the taste and so do not filter? Um, so what I'm assuming you're trying to ask me is, are the microplastics actually just affecting whether or not the oysters want to eat the food? Um, I think another way of thinking about it is if microplastics do make oysters not want to filter then we have a problem anyway since this synthetic addition is making it so that oysters aren't performing what they naturally do so i think it's less whether or not the microplastics added will make the oysters not want to eat it's i think the main issue is more adding microplastics and if that is an effect of it will basically already alter the natural environment and i think thinking it Thinking about it like that is um, a bit dangerous because whether or not that is the case, I think the main concern is that the oysters won't perform what they naturally do. But, Thanks, um, Phoebe. Yeah. So we've got another question here from Johan. So Johan says, interesting topic and a good attempt to get some answers. Did you look at microplastics in the water without oysters? Um, for example, are we sure that the microplastics was impacting the oysters, not just impacting the water by itself. Um, so I'm a bit uncertain about what you you mean with that question, but if I was, um, I didn't, my control for this experiment was um, microplastics added, um, no, having oysters filtering water without microplastics. And they did have a rate um, of zero, uh, of the, that was the standard I was comparing my results to. Um, so when you're asking whether or not I just left microplastics in a beaker with micro, uh, without any oyster, I didn't do that because I, I was more looking at whether or not it would affect the oysters, not whether or not the microplastics would affect the phytoplankton. Sorry. Thanks, um, Phoebe. So we do actually have a question, another question from um, mm -hmm. Jorg, who would like to actually ask that question verbally. So we're just gonna um, let Jorg um, unmute him so that he can um, speak. So Jorg, are you there? 
I sure am. Can you hear me? Yep, great. Hello. Hi. Very, sorry I came in late to the first talk. I think it was the first talk, but I found your OS talk very interesting. But, you know, I think the main thing is microplastics kill things. So they kill the oysters mm -hmm. as part of the food chain. Yep. So did you, have, did you do any sort of statistics on how long your oysters will last before they die with the microplastics in the water? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I did do prior to this was I did have several test runs of microplastics and the oysters, and I didn't find that any of the oysters died. So that was my basis for going through with this experiment. I did have times where the oysters died from having too much phytoplankton and that taking all the oxygen, but I wasn't aware if um, the microplastics themselves uh, without the phytoplankton would directly impact the oysters. The fact that um, the electron microscope showed that the microplastics did go into the oysters like tissues, I would consider that a basis for the fact that the microplastics were able to basically penetrate and infiltrate the oyster. So definitely yeah. the microplastics does have an effect on the oysters apart from simply stopping them from filtering. Yeah, the, the microplastics get in, kill the oysters eventually. I, about yeah. 50, 40 years ago, I was sitting at dinner with a, one of the world's most famous ecologists, Eugene Odom and Bill Weeby. And they were explaining to me what's in oysters. Since that day, I never eat oysters again. <laughs> because they filter out everything. And uh, That's you know, right. it's a very dangerous thing, these microplastics. Um, so if we can turn on the microscope, I can show you guys what a Stockholm Water Prize looks like. Thanks so much, Jorg. So we do have to keep going because we've got to announce the winner. So um, I will wrap up there. Thank you so much, um, Phoebe, for your presentation. And yeah, it's Thank really you. great to see you um, tackling some of these issues that are facing our waterways and our marine ecosystems. We'd love to see how your research continues in the future. So before we announce this year's winner, I'd now like to invite Jim Athanis, Managing Director Oceana at Xylem to say a few words as our award sponsor. Hi, Jim. Hi, how are you all? Great. Well, um, wow. That's all I really can say. Uh, so inspiring and exciting uh, projects and um, what a privilege uh, for, for Xylem and the AWA and Stockholm Junior Water Prize to, to be sitting here and listening to such great, creative and innovative young minds. Um, I must say very, very, very touching, very, very inspiring. Um, at Xylem, we, we have a saying that it's an opportunity of a lifetime we have. Um, and really it's about driving awareness around, you know, clean, safe water, because it's really, you know, the, the, the need of everyone to make sure we provide um, everyone in society clean, safe water, uh, because where we have clean water, we have life. And I think just the last project really, you know, demonstrates that um, quite pertinently and, and also the farm projects. So they all have elements of those that, that, that are so critical. Um, you know, we can't underestimate um, the, the impact um, that, you know, these projects will, will, will I'm sure, live on beyond um, this great, um, you know, opportunity that hopefully you all have um, um, had the opportunity to, to, to take part on. So really, I, I want to also say thank you to the Stockholm Junior Water Prize, uh, the Australian Water Association for having the privilege uh, to sponsor this great uh, award. Um, where we bring young, creative and innovative minds together um, to really celebrate, you know, great water projects that, like I mentioned, I think every single project has merits to really live on beyond this. And I really want to encourage all of you to continue to find inspiration and, and really take these on uh, further. I also want to encourage everyone on the line to really continue having these robust discussions around water, around the dinner table, with friends, families, peers, teachers. It's just so important. And I think as one of the presentations alluded to, you know, with the you know, UN sustainability goals, it is something that we have to have front and center of mind because we have one earth and we need to look after it. And water is a, a critical part of that. Um, so again, um, please continue to, to inspire many others um, thank you again to the Australian Water Association um, and I wish you all well and over to you Jonathan to announce the winner. 
Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Ireland, for your ongoing support and commitment to the Australian Stockholm Junior Water Prize. I'd now like to welcome Jonathan McEwen, Chief Executive of the Australian Water Association, to announce this year's winner. Thank you very much, Katie, and congratulations to our four finalists who have done a fantastic job um, in presenting such innovative ideas to very heartfelt concerns, not just within the water sector, but across the Australian community. Listening to Olivia, George, Emma and Phoebe speak, it really made me feel as if I was in some PhD presentation at a university. And it's hard to believe these great minds and such articulate people uh, within our secondary school system. But what an encouragement for all of us to hear the four of you speak so eloquently this afternoon. It's terrific to see the issues that Australia is confronting and one of the great being addressed so, so well by young minds, but one of the great things that gives this um, award such status in the water sector, it's the meeting of true minds, the, anal the analysis of science and the creation of commercial opportunities that together solve major sustainable water issues. And so each one of your um, research projects had all those trays to them and I wish each and every one of you every success in pursuing your ideas further. So we know the water industry is in great hands um, with minds like these coming through. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to announce the winner for the 2020 Australian Stockholm, Stockholm Junior Water Prize is Emma Ceresia. Emma, here is, I don't know whether you can see it, this is, your, this is your prize, and we look forward to presenting it to you, Emma, uh, and we hope that um, you'll be able to see it um, very soon. Congratulations to Emma. As mentioned, Emma um, will be now representing Australia on the international stage, competing against over 35 countries later this year. The international competition will be held online in an online format this year. Sadly, that means Emma's not able to get across to Stockholm, but the AWA uh, will be looking at every opportunity to provide Emma with some special um, professional development here in Australia over the next 12 months. Emma, congratulations, and would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, so thank you so much. This is so exciting. Um, as Jim said, it's such an important aspect of our society. Um, and it's so inspiring to me to see all the other finalists and their projects. And I just wish everyone the best. So thank you so much. Thanks, Emma. Congratulations. And thanks, Jonathan, for announcing our winner. Um, so I'd just like to say a few final thank yous before we um, close off today's webinar. Um, so firstly, I'd like to thank all our finalists. You've done a great job presenting today. Um, and you've each got really bright futures ahead of you. So we really look forward to hearing more from each of you. Um, I'd also like to thank your teachers and schools. We know the hard work and effort you each contribute to these students' lives. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Island. Thank you, Jim. Um, and I'd also like to thank our judging panel this year who are probably mostly on the line. So I just want to thank them um, individually. So we had Dr. Jeremy Lucas, Professor Stuart Kahn, Philip um, Rakeley, and Jodie Ann Dorr, so thank you judges. Um, our judges each provided a bit of mentoring to our finalists over the past few weeks um, to prepare for this presentation, so I really wanna thank the judges for their time. Um, and a final thank you, thank you to you, our audience, for joining today's webinar. We really hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out anything more about any of our finalists today or the award itself, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, I can share my contact details now on the screen. Um, our website for this um, Stockholm Junior Water Prize is www.awa.asn.au slash ASJWP, which has all our information. Um, and next year's competition um, will open for entries in August. So um, we'll keep you up to date with Emma's progress in the international competition. But um, thank you all for joining us today.